It's the universal question asked of marketers all around the world. How do we make customers want our stuff? Every company wants to build better relationships with their customers. It inevitably means more profitable and sustainable relationships and improves brand equity and ultimately share prices. The main challenge, of course, is figuring out just how to do it. Is it about lowering prices? Is it about improving quality? Maybe it's about better customer service. And that's where research can really help. Obviously, every consumer is different. Everyone has different needs, attitudes, and preferences. But we do see some fairly consistent trends across different market segments. And as a result, it's possible to identify different areas of the customer experience that will allow us to get the best bang for our buck. As with all CX related topics, the best people to tell us how to impress our customers are in fact the customers themselves. And so we should always try to avoid guessing what will have the biggest impact on their buying decisions. It's risky at best and at worst can lead to companies making some seriously bad investments. One of the most iconic examples of how it can go wrong when marketers make assumptions about their customers' needs was the release of New Coke in 1985, and it will absolutely go down as one of the greatest marketing failures of the 20th century. You see, executives at Coca-Cola were worried that their product was staying to age, and as a result, they felt that it needed to be innovated. So they came up with a new formula for Coke and ran a bunch of blind taste testing workshops. The results found that consumers prefer the taste of new Coke over traditional Coke, and so they released it. As they'd soon learned though, many Americans don't actually buy Coke for its taste. The truth is that Coke has an iconic place in American culture. Most kids grow up on it with their parents giving it to them as a treat. So culturally in the US, Coke actually plays a really important for many people as an indicator of familial bonding. By changing the formula, Coke executives were essentially betraying their customers at the deepest of emotional levels. Consumers were so furious that they started calling Coke's HQ office en masse with upwards of 1,500 calls each day. And in fact, there's a rumor in the marketing industry that many callers were so distraught that Coke allegedly hired psychologists to man their phones because it sounded like some of the consumers were speaking about the death of family members and it was actually traumatizing Coke staff. Now, whether it's true or not, I can't say, but it does show you how important it is to understand what drives consumer decisions. And this is where a driver analysis comes into play. Customers aren't always rational, so it's important to ask questions in the right way so that they can give you an honest answer, even if they're not sure what that answer might be. Let me explain. A lot of customer decisions are driven by subconscious motivators. Things like perceived value are rarely as simple as asking consumers which product is cheapest and offers the best features. Factors like branding, aesthetics, social media presence are all things that affect consumer decisions. Many people just don't like to admit it, or they may not even be aware of it. Now that doesn't mean consumers can't tell us what drives their decision making, but it does mean we have to be a little bit crafty in how we ask those questions. In the market research and econometrics literature, there's a neat field of thinking that we refer to as stated versus revealed analyses. Stated analyses occur when we directly ask consumers about things such as brand preference or if they're willing to pay for hypothetical products. From there, companies will often ask what the most important considerations are in that decision. Now, of course, as you'd expect, most people will respond quite rationally to that question. They'll say things like price, value, reliability, any number of things that they know they should be using as the reasons for buying products. But of course, as we mentioned earlier, those factors or drivers often don't end up being great predictors of actual behavior in the market. So to address that cognitive dissonance, researchers like to approach the situation less directly using what is known as revealed analyses. And revealed analyses approach questions less directly. For example, we might show customers a series of different products or brands and ask them to rate each of those brands on a range of different factors. That might include things like price, perceived quality, brand reputation, and anything else we think could have an impact on their decision, be it conscious or subliminal. From there, it's only a short step to understand which of those factors we should invest most heavily into if we want to drive consumer engagement. Now, there are heaps of different types of revealed analyses available researchers from maximum differential analysis to conjoint modeling and many others. For today, we're just going to focus on driver analyses. 
as a starting point. It's important to note that driver analysis is an umbrella term used to describe a variety of different statistical techniques. While each technique is different, they ultimately help organizations understand which elements of the customer experience have the most impact on crucial outcomes such as satisfaction, advocacy, brand preference, or at the very end, sales. Some examples of well-known driver analyses include correlations, regression, structural equation, modeling, and several others. Now I'm conscious of not overcomplicating things, so I won't go into too much detail explaining the mathematics behind each of these techniques, but suffice to say that they essentially help understand the relationship between customer experience and core performance metrics. Typically, driver scores are presented as a score between negative 100 and positive 100. At negative 100, there is a perfectly opposite relationship between a factor and your desired outcome. So for every one point you score on a factor, you will lose the same amount on your desired outcome, whether it be purchase likelihood, satisfaction, or any other KPI. On the other end of the scale, you guessed it, a score of 100 means there is a perfect relationship and that factor will have the largest impact on your desired outcome. In the middle, if you receive a score of zero, there's absolutely no relationship between the factor and your KPI. So let's look at an example. Say we're developing a new type of soda and we wanna know what makes people likely to try it. Using a driver analysis, we might get people to look at five existing types of soda, uh, maybe Coke, Fanta, Sprite, Mountain Dew, and Creaming Soda. We then start by asking them to rank the five sodas in terms of how likely they are to drink them. For me, it might look like this. Now, I know it's controversial that I put Coke last, but I'm gonna need you to hop all the way off my back about it. It's just not that good. Following that, we might ask people to rate each soda on five factors, taste, price, brand, reputation, bubbliness, and boringness. And from there, we might end up with a matrix that looks something like this. Now, it's not all that interesting when you do that test with one person, particularly someone who hates Coke. But when you replicate it with another 1,000 or more people, we might end up with something that looks a little more like this. And what this tells us is that if we want our new soda to be popular and sell really, really well, then we should consider prioritizing each of these things in this order. Of course, the analysis isn't telling us how much money we should invest into each of these areas. It just tells us what will have the biggest impact. So investing in bubbliness, for example, would have twice the impact of boringness. So there you have it. If you wanna answer the age old question of how do we make customers want to buy our stuff, then driver analysis is probably a good way to start. It can really help pique interest and ultimately engagement with your product. If you're interested in learning more about how research can help you develop better products and customer experiences, then reach out or leave a comment on the video. Also leave a like, it's always super helpful. Keep listening, keep learning, and most of all, Mountain Dew for life.